Uh, and nearly 30 years later, he's working under a number of different names and owners. John is the commercial manager for British Steel's rail business. Uh, having worked in a number of mainly commercial roles, John is responsible for the UK and Irish markets, managing the key accounts such as the usual suspects of Network Rail, TfL and Irish Rail. John also played a pivotal role in the transfer of rail production from Workington to Scunny, which was back in 20, uh, 2006, sorry, uh, and they introduced the as rolled long length rails into the UK market. Stephen, Stephen Lewis, his colleague with him, he joined British Steel's uh, rail technology department uh, three or four years ago as a consultant, working on forensic investigations of broken rails, conducting rail surveys and assisting the company with R&D and product development. In 2021, Stephen became the manager of the rail technologies department, or uh, sorry, he became the manager of the rail technology department, uh, but before starting at British Steel, Stephen worked as a researcher at the University of Sheffield, where he built up his expertise in wheel rail contact, wear and rolling contact fatigue, rail welding, low adhesion and rail metallurgy. He also has a Bachelor's of Engineering's degree in Mechanical Engineering and a PhD in Tribology of the wheel rail contact and is also a chartered engineer. So, gents, uh, I'll hand over uh, the mantle to your good selves. Uh, over to you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, there's not the cameras off just while we're doing the uh, the notes, so it's all right. Yeah, that's of course fine. Okay. All right. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, so it's um, a joint presentation, as, as Colin said, and uh, it's going to start with myself, John Austin. <coughs> Right. So a little bit about uh, a little bit with a brief introduction into British Steel. So uh, as Colin mentioned, I first started working for what I call the original British Steel back in the mid 90s. Um, and throughout my career, there's been a number of different names and owners. But in 2016, the British Steel brand was brought back. Uh, then in March 2020, we were bought by the Chinese multi industrial industrial company Jingye Group. Uh, this marked an exciting new chapter in British steel making. So who is British steel? Well, quality is paramount in, in all of our production routes. We make rails, sections, special profiles and wire rod to the highest quality to meet the most demanding applications around the world. With a long heritage, making iron for 155 years and steel for over 130 years in the Scunthorpe area. So whilst we have a rich history under our new ownership, we are very much focused on the future. So who is, who is Jing Ye? So in March 2020, British Steel was bought by the Chinese multi-industrial company Jing Ye Steel. After going through a thorough and detailed due diligence process, Jing Ye committed to buying British Steel with a clear investment plan. As you can see from their history, Jing Ye's expansion and growth has been extensive over a short period of time. Community, environment and sustainability is at the forefront of everything they do and the Jingye Group has played significant parts in the development of key projects in China, including the Three Gorges Project, Beijing's Daxin International Airport and Brunei's Cross Sea Bridge Project. British Steel's main manufacturing site in Scunthorpe is an integrated steelworks, meaning it takes raw materials from all over the world and manufacture them into steel, of which we'll explain how in more detail later in this presentation. The steel is then reheated and re-rolled through a number of mills in Scunthorpe, Teesside, Skinning Grove and Alblasserdam, <coughs> which is in the Netherlands. The steel is manufactured into a number of different products, which are then used in a variety of demanded markets, as detailed on this slide. We're proud to work in collaboration with a wide range of customers on a global scale. This slide shows just a handful of our major customers who we work with through the different markets and our products are supplied into. We are proud to supply steel products that help build some remarkable projects, not just in the UK, but worldwide. So let's have a look at some of those projects that we've uh, we've helped build. 
Most of these I'm sure you would have heard of and some you may have already personally, uh, personally visited. British Steel is honoured to have played a part in some of the most iconic projects from around the world. We manufacture steel that can be used in extensive range of applications and can make over 1400 different steel specifications. We have manufacturing facilities in the UK and Netherlands, supported by distribution facilities in the UK and Ireland. To support sales worldwide, we also have a global network of regional sales teams. So that was a brief introduction into British Steel. Now a little bit more about the products that we manufacture. We manufacture a wide range of structural sections, predominantly for the construction industry. Standard dimensions are supplied in the as rolled condition from our mills in Scunthorpe and Teesside. Further processing, including shot blasting and priming, are carried out through our downstream processing facilities. British steel sections are also extensively used in the fabricated steel that's used for the overhead line electrification. The special profiles division predominantly focus on products supplied to the yellow goods market. However, our unique roll design and mach machining capabilities allows us to create the rolls and tooling necessary to manufacture an extensive range of special profiles. The rolling mill in Skinny Grove also has the ability to produce crane rails. Our wire rod product range is used in markets such as automotive, construction, engineering and consumer goods. But the wire rod is also used to manufacture rail clips used on network, on railway networks. But probably more, more interesting for this audience is, is, is rail. So we manufacture a, a wide range of rail, rail profiles for use in a number of applications suitable for the UK and global networks. Manufactured in as road lengths of up to 120 metres and through our flashbook welding depot, we have the ability to produce welding strings of 216 metres. Rail profiles can be manufactured in standard, standard grade and our unique as road premium rail HP335. <coughs> We manufacture a wide range of flat bottom rails to cover the needs of mainline networks and we also produce bullhead and conductor rails to satisfy the demands of the main UK networks. Further profiles are currently under, under development to widen our range into other markets outside of the UK and Europe. Since Jingye took over in March 2020, the priority has been very much focused on investment. And I'll now explain some of the investments made so far on Jingye's relatively short journey. <clears throat> in 2021, we announced the single largest investment for more than 30 years in our special profiles business. The £26 million project will see a new downstream processing facilities constructed at our Skinning Grove site. The new service centre, which will include cut to length lines, product milling, machining and warehouse operations, will enable us to make and process an extended range of value added profiles for the faultlift industry. <clears throat> the advanced milling and machining capability will also mean we can offer profiles with world leading tolerances of just 0.1 millimetres. A one million pound state of the art laser measurement system is now up and running at our spe <coughs> special profiles business, forming part of a suite of patented technologies currently being developed. The new system, which provides millions of dimensional re readings on every bar rolled, will ensure products are made to world leading dimensional tolerances. An investment of uh, half a million pounds was made in 2021 in our special profiles mill at Skinning Grove to create a further process and inspection facility on site. The facility is now fully operational, having been delivered on time and on budget in just two months. The facility has given our special profiles team the ability to carry out edge grinding, buffing, cold sawing and mitre cutting on site with the installation of two new saws and an automated grinding machine. <clears throat> we have started work on an £80 million of investment to enhance our product range and improve our operational and environmental performance. The bulk of this investment, approximately £48 million, is financing the installation of new billet caster at the company's Scunthorpe site. At the, same time, at the same time, our Scunthorpe rod mill is being given a £32 million upgrade, while further investments are being made at FN Steel, our sister company in Netherlands. Three new cranes are being installed at our Immingham bulk terminal. The new unloaders will replace the existing cranes that have been operating at the port facility since 1970s. The cranes are more efficient and have semi-automatic mode that will increase efficiency. 
And then in early 2021, British Steel completed the installation of a new £800,000 state-of-the-art environmental system at its Scunthorpe site to transform the way it monitors the water network. The investment in oil detection and skimming equipment has been welcomed by the company's environmental regulators, the Environmental Agency, as well as improving the management of oil. The new equipment also helps the company, company's environment, environmental experts sorry, to monitor the quality of the on-site water network. Earlier this year, we were awarded another major rail contract extension by Network Rail. The two-year agreement sees us retain our position as principal supplier to the company, which operates and maintains Britain's rail infrastructure. By the time the con contract con concludes in March 2024, employees at our Scunthorpe headquarters will have supplied Network Rail with more than 1 million tonnes of rail during the decade. In addition to the supply of rails, the contract will also see us build two new developments to further enhance services to Network Rail. They are a multi-million pound new storage facility for long length rails and a dedicated train servicing facility to allow essential maintenance to network rail's rail delivery trains. These investments embed the long term relationship between network rail and ourselves, looking forward to future rail supply in the next control period and beyond. I'll, I'll pass over to Steve, who will take us through the steel making process. OK, thanks, John. Um, so this part of the presentation, I'm just going to basically go through um, how we turn um, iron oxide, which is essentially a rock, uh, into a final finished product, which is a rail. Um, so we've, we've got a process map here. Um, so this takes from the very beginning of the process, we would put the raw, raw ingredients into our various parts of the mill. Um, where we have, and then this this process will take us to where we've got steel um, in solid form. Um, so when we we're, we're talking about the this, the initial part of the process, there are there are three main ingredients that we want to put into the blast furnace. So the thing the first thing we need to create is iron, and that's done in the blast furnace. So first of all, we need coal or coke um, to give us some combustion. We need the, the ore itself, the iron oxide, and we need uh, limestone. Um, now, the, the crushed um, iron oxide is, is too fine a powder uh, to put into a blast furnace. It, it, would, it would choke the furnace. So it needs to be turned into pellets, um, which are, are nice and porous and give you a lot of surface area to give you a nice um, chemical reaction. Um, so you put these into the blast furnace. The coke burns at um, 2000 degrees C. We blow um, hot air into the bottom of the furnace at 1000 degrees C. And um, what happens is the, the, the carbon in the coke, the coke um, steals the oxygen away from the iron oxide, leaving you with pure iron that floats down to the bottom of the, the blast furnace. And the limestone takes up any other impurities uh, that are in there as well. So you're getting um, not pure, but you know much uh, much purer iron uh, delivered to the bottom of the blast furnace. Uh, so these are four um, blast furnaces in Scunthorpe. Uh, they're, they're locally known as the Four Queens. Uh, we've got Mary, Bess, um, Anne and Victoria and Anne and Victoria, the two big ones. And then we've got Mary and Bess that are a bit smaller. Um, so those raw ingredients that I, I just showed you, these, these travel up these conveyors here that you can see and, and get tipped in to the top of the blast furnace. Now, once that iron is, is ready to be tapped off, um, so typically um, the blast furnaces will produce between 250 and 300 tonnes of iron every 45 minutes. And once that's ready, it's 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 emptied into a, what we call a, a rail torpedo. Um, so it's a special rail vehicle, um, which which is basically pushed underneath the furnace and the iron is emptied out in, into it. You can see a few torpedoes here. These have just been uh, filled up with iron. You can see the steam. Uh, coming out of the top. So that iron that goes into the furnace is about 1500 degrees C. Um, and the, the total weight of the uh, uh, one individual torpedo is about 550 tonnes. Now, 
the, these these are such heavy rail ve vehicles that they've actually got 12 axles. So they've got two bogies with six axles on each bogey. So to put that into context, um, a passenger vehicle, a, a, the train that you commute to work on or go on holiday on, will have two bogies and there'll be two axles on each bogey. Um, and that will, your axle weight on a, on a typical commuter vehicle wouldn't really exceed 10 tonnes. Here, we've got an axle weight of about 46 tonnes, um, so more than four times um, what you get on a typical train. So we like to put our rail through its paces um, on, at the Scunthorpe Mill. Um, so the torpedo will move out from underneath the blast furnace and then it will make its way to the BOSS plant. The BOSS, it, BOSS is short for Basic Oxygen Steel Making Process. So you can see here that the iron's been poured out of the torpedo um, and it'll be poured into um, the first stage of the steel making process. So remember, we haven't actually got steel yet. We've only got iron, iron here. And I'll go through the definition between iron and steel as we go on through this presentation. So you can see an empty torpedo here. So this has just been emptied um, in, into the BOSS plant. And in order to, to stop these things from cooling down too quickly, um, we leave a, an, ox, a, a, an oxypropane burner in there to, to, to let it cool down at a much slower rate so that we don't damage the, the factory lining in the torpedo. And then once that's kind of cool, kept at a constant temperature, it will be straight back out underneath the furnace to get some more um, iron. Um, I did say that, that, so the difference between iron and steel, so iron at this point has got a carbon content of around about 4%. That's much higher than what we, we'd really want. So for, for rail steel, we, we're not really, we don't usually look any more than 1%. So you, your R260 grade, your standard grade rail is about 0.6, 0.7% carbon. And a premium rail might be anywhere between 0.8 and 1% carbon. So there's a lot of carbon in this iron, and as, as well as turning it into steel by adding various alloying elements, we need to get rid of that, that excess carbon that's in there. So back to our di root diagram. So we've taken the iron out of the bottom of the blast furnace, and now this torpedo will be taken by train to the BOSS plant. And the first stage is pretreatment. And this is essentially um, to get rid of excess sulfur in in the steel um, so it's, it's blasted with oxygen the sulfur will float to the surface and then it can be scraped off um, and then it's taken to the next stage so we're still talking about iron at this stage we've only re removed some sulfur so this iron will then be transferred to um, the boss converter but before we do that uh, we put a bit of scrap steel into the, the boss converter um, and the reason we do that, apart from doing a bit of recycling, is that the scrap steel actually acts as a, a protector of, of the delicate lining on the on the on the boss vessel, um, and it, it absorbs that thermal shock, so that when this 1500 degree uh, C iron is poured in there, it's that steel that that scrap steel that will take most of that shock, and not the not the lining of the boss vessel. Um, and while while it's in in, in the boss vessel, um, there'll, there'll be other processes in, in there to, to, re, to remove some of that carbon. And one of those things is uh, a, a air is, is, is blasted in at twice the speed of sound. Um, and what that does is it removes a lot of that excess carbon. It, the oxygen reacts with the carbon and, and removes it from the steel that way. So we're almost there to having what we can call steel now. And the next stage is is the secondary steel making process. Um, so you get, there's just some photos here showing that, that this is where the um, iron has been poured into the boss vessel. So the, the scrap metal has been put in first and then that's where we charge the iron in there. And then this is what the boss vessel looks like. Um, so here is where most of the carbon it is removed and we've got something now that resembles resembles steel. So the next next part is the secondary steel making process and this is really where we start to refine the 
chemical constituents of the steel. So steel is, is an alloy and it can, it can be tailored to different um, requirements. So to put it in a rail context, you've got standard grade rail R260 and you've got um, premium rail such as HP335. This is the part where R260 or HP335 are born. This is um, a bit like a chef baking his cake at this point. This is where the ingredients are added and a bit more refinement is done to the steel to, to remove any, um, a, a, any anything in there that we don't want. Another thing that happens at this stage as well is um, argon gas, which is inert, is actually bubbled through the steel um, to bring any imperfections or inclusions to the surface, but it also mixes the steel as well. And you can see a photo of this stage here. So this, this lens here is, is actually, uh, it's doing two things. It's mixing the steel, but it's also passing a current through there to keep it at an ideal temperature. So different steels might want to be cast at different temperatures. So we, we, we can control the temperature at this stage as well. And then finally, before the, the steel it starts to be turned into a solid, we do something called a, a vacuum degas. And this can be seen in that picture there. Um, so this, this device comes into the top of the ladle. It's, it's sucked through one of these nozzles here and then fed back out through the other. And what we're doing at this stage is we're removing any gas and primarily hydrogen. And, and, we, and we don't want hydrogen in um, rail steels because this is, tends to be what happens. Um, so this is a Tash Aval. Uh, this is a very rare defect these days. It's been eliminated, but back in the day when the control of the process wasn't as refined as it is, uh, we used to get hydrogen cracking like this and get, get a lot of broken rails. But that's a, a, a defect that thankfully we don't see a lot of these days. So we've got steel now, um, but it's two problems. It's still liquid and it's still very hot. So now we need to start turning it back into a, a solid. So we, we've got somewhere around about 250 tonnes worth of, of steel here. So we need to start turning that into something practical that we can we can start manipulating. So the as you'll see in the next video, um, this the, the ladle is moved into position, a plug is opened at the bottom, and then the, the, the steel starts to flow into what we call the tun dish, which is here. And then from the bottom of the tun dish, um, the steel fall, uh, falls into um, a copper cooled mould. Now there's there's three products that are made at this stage. There's blooms, there's billets, and there's slabs. And I'm going, just going to concentrate on blooms because that's what rail is, is is rolled from. So rail is is essentially a, a 300 millimeter square section um, of steel, and that's what this mold is doing. Now the mold the mold is water cooled as well because what you what you want to do is you want to form a solid skin on on the steel. So remember it, it's still liquid at this point. But you want to form a solid skin so that um, it contains itself in, in that square shape. So as you and then the next thing we need to do is we need to turn it through 90 degrees um, so that it's in a horizontal plane and it's it's easier for us to manipulate. So all the way th down through here, you'll have a solid skin on the steel, but you'll actually still have a liquid core. And as, as, you, as the steel's coming down through this process, that core will start to solidify. And as we get to this blue mark here, that's where we've got 100% solidification uh, in the process. So once we get to this point, the as you'll see in the next video, uh, the steel is, is flame cut and that bloom is cut to about eight and a half metres in length. Um, so we should be able to see that in this next video. So this is the ladle here and it's been emptied now into the tun dish. Uh, these are what the blooms look like. So you can still they're still still glowing red hot at this stage. This is the flame cutting, and then finally the blooms are, are moved out of the mill and and put into um, outside storage. And and at this place they'll they'll be left to cool back down to a, a normal temperature, and then they will be shipped to the various different mills uh, that we've got around site. So as John mentioned, we've got rod sections and rail that we make at Scunthorpe. So these blooms will be uh, delivered to different areas of the plant. 
and this is just a, a really nice photo of the of the continuous casting process. So this process that I just showed you, where we're taking the the bloom through ninety degrees into a horizontal position. So you still will be getting poured in up here, going through the copper moulds, and then you've got five strands where the blooms have been created. So here, although you, the, the, the bloom is solid on the outside, it will still be liquid on the inside. And as you're travelling down in this direction, it, the, the middle will start to be solidifying. And you can kind of see that cooling going on as the, as the, the colour gets darker as, as you move down um, towards the end here. Mm -hmm. Right, so how do we turn that bloom into a rail? So there's a video on the next slide now, and I'm, I'm just going to try and, and talk you through it um, um, as it goes on. So the, the bloom gets pushed into a secondary reheat furnace because it needs to be warmed back up again. Um, it's descaled because when it's hot, it reacts with the oxygen in the air. You get this scale on the surface, so we need to get rid of that. Um, the rail then is then sent through a, a series of rollers where it starts to take on a rail shape um, and it, it passes back and forth through these stands and, and eventually you'll end up with something that looks like a rail. You can see a lot of water is used in this process, there's a lot of steam and the reason we do that is because you need to keep the rollers cool um, because the rollers are, are in contact with this iron which is you know about 1200, sorry this steel that's about 1200 degrees C. Um, so they need to be kept cool, otherwise they will um, crack. And then you can see here a machine that's that's stamping the the ID number into into the rail. So so after this process, the 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 the, the blooms start at one end of the mill uh, at eight and a half meters in length. They will come out the other end as a rail, but they will be 120 metres in length. Um, so that squashing down of the bloom into a rail actually ex extends the length of the rail as well. So that needs to be taken into account during the rolling process. So the, the, the bloom at the rail end of the mill will be travelling much faster than the, the, the rail at the bloom end of the mill, and that's something that we need to take into account as we're doing the rolling. And this is a nice little animation here that just shows you how we gradually go from a bloom into, into a rail shape. So I'll let this keep playing um, and go through it with you. So we initially start forming a dog bone shape, and you can see then how the, the rail web is formed. And then eventually you go through a set of finishing stands and you'll end up with, with something that, that looks like a rail. So I'll, I'll let this play just one more time so you can see. So we're forming that dog bone shape and then you can see the, the, the web was formed at that process there. And then you end up with, with your rail shape. So I'll hand it back over to John, who's going to go through our low carbon roadmap. So the UK has set two key national targets for decarbonisation. Firstly, by 2035, the aim is to achieve a 78% reduction in CO2 emissions, with the baseline being 1990 levels. The next and final stage is to be net zero by 2050. The other main recognised monitor of carbon emissions is the Science Based Target Initiative. <clears throat> Science-based targets provide a clearly defined pathway for companies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Targets are set and considered science-based if they are in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement. British Steel signed up and committed to the Science-based Target Initiative in September of this year. So why focus on steel? Well, steel production is an extremely carbon-intensive carbon uh, industry. In the UK, British Steel's integrated steelworks is the third largest producer of carbon, only behind Pembroke Power Station and Tyler Steel's Port, Stal Port Talbot Steelworks. Globally, between 7 and 9% of all man-made CO2 emissions are from steelmaking. And this is why it's important that the world steel industry collectively embarks on a decarbonisation journey. So where is our focus? We are aiming to reduce our scope one and two carbon intensity by more than 80% by, 20, by 2035. Scope one covers direct emissions from processing. 
For this includes emissions from our iron and steel making activities and also from our on-site generated electri electricity and steam. Our emissions trading scheme data as third party verification. Scope two is indirect emissions. For, for our sites, these mainly arise around uh, purchase electricity. We measure our scope two emissions using the UK government greenhouse gases conversion factors combined with our invoiced imported electricity usage. And then finally, scope three covers indirect emissions outside scopes one and two. These include items in the value chain like raw materials, company vehicles, transport, distribution and business travel. For scope three emissions, we use the world steel method methodology, which is backed up by an international ISO standard. So we are aiming to reduce our scope one and two carbon intensity by more than 80% by 2035. Sorry. Um, to help achieve these targets, we will use a range of techniques and innovations, including steel product innovation to promote the material benefits to end users, for example, through light weighting and life extension, supporting recycling and reuse, deploying circular economy and material efficiency methodologies, assessing and adopting several technology options, including carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, increasing scrap, scrap utilization and electric arc furnace. So this is our low low carbon roadmap that uh, that we uh, published this year, and it just shows you over the over the period of time between 2020 and 2035 the reduction of of, of what uh, the, the carbon emissions and how we're going to do that through each different stages. By adopting a science based target initiative, we will play our part in limiting global warming to well below two degrees centigrade above pre industrial levels and pursue efforts to limit warming to one and a half degrees centigrade. It's important to note that our low carbon roadmap is also a fully costed business model. Therefore, the significant investment required to reduce our carbon emissions also ensures a sustainable future for steel making in the Scunthorpe area. However, the, however, the significant investment required to achieve aggressive emission targets uh, as set out by the UK government requires appropriate government support through policies and frameworks. British Steel is one of 12 companies across the Humber region who make up the Zero Carbon Humber Partnership. So the Zero Carbon Humber Partnership aims to create the world's first net zero industrial cluster by 2040 through low carbon hydrogen, carbon capture and negative emissions, known as carbon removal technology. The project aims to remove nearly 50% of all UK industrial cluster CO2 emissions. The, re the reason that we're looking at this is because of the location of these carbon intensive um, industries around around the Humber region and our um, location close to the uh, to the North Sea. So we're already making big efforts towards decarbonisation, but it is re important to remember that while our low carbon roadmap looks towards the future, it also focuses on the products that we currently offer. We supply a wide range of global markets, including rail, automotive and uh, construction. Over recent years, we've introduced a range of in innovative solutions, including weathering steel, structural sections. Product life is extended thanks to the steel's protective oxide layer. This makes it ideal for use in exposed locations like bridges, building and catenary gantries on railway lines. Higher strength crane rail, which offers better durability and service with the potential to use lighter sections reducing insulation and transport costs associated with greenhouse gas emissions and high tensile wire rod. The high strength to weight ratio of our high tensile wire rod not only reduces energy consumption in rope, cable production and insulation, it also reduces cable and superstructure weight. For the rail industry, we have already two proven solutions to help with sustainability, of which Steve will now talk to in more detail. OK, so as, as John just went through there, um, how we can decarbonise the, the production, but actually the products themselves can help reduce the overall carbon life cycle content um, or contribution of the of the material so that, the, you know, the, the embodied carbon of the product. So I'm going to talk about rail first and how our HP335 material is is helping achieve that 
Um, so this this is a site known as Het Mill up in the north of England. Um, and this was one of the first sites actually in the UK for um, HP335 to be installed. Um, so th this is the curve here. Um, it's approximately 1200 um, meter radius um, and it used to be plagued by RCF. Um, so this is what the R260 rail used to look like before um, the HP was um, installed. And approximately every five years that rail had to be replaced uh, because these cracks just got too deep um, and they couldn't, couldn't be managed. The, the HP was installed, as I say, in January 2011. And what, we, what we've seen is, a, is a, a vast reduction, almost an elimination of um, rolling contact fatigue. So now the, the, the rail's life is actually determined by wear. Um, so Network Rail has a wear limit of, of 14 millimetres head wear. So what we've used to do, what we've done is we've, we've, proje we've projected that rail life um, by predicting how long it would take to wear down to 14 millimetres. Um, based on um, the wear rates that we're, we're measuring. So we're, we're seeing, we're predicting a rail life extension um, in, the, in the region of about 29 years um, versus the five years that was there um, when we just had the R260. Um, so that's, that's one, one way that our products can help actually achieve a, a more efficient use of the, of the railway itself. Because uh, you know, you don't have to send people out, people and, and vehicles and, and all sorts of equipment every five years to do a rail replacement. You can do it every every 25 plus years instead. Um, another example that we've got here is, is, a, is a, um, sh a station called Shipley, very close to where I, I grew up, actually. Um, so this was another site that was plagued by RCF um, on the on the low rail. This is what the um, the R260 rail used to look like um, beforehand. Now it's a highly canted curve with passenger vehicles coming in and stopping on a, on a highly canted curve. So a lot of, of load has been placed on that, that low rail. Um, and the, the 260 had to be repl replaced every two years uh, because it got to this state uh, quite quickly. Now the, the HP has been put in um, since March 2011. It's, it's still um, still there, still going strong, and I, I spoke to Network Rail recently, and the, the rail is still there. So the last measurement we made was back in 2015, and we were projecting a rail life of around about 12 years. Um, so that's a 10 that's a 10 year increase on on what we were seeing before. Um, but as I say, that that rail looks like it's still going strong. So we need to go out there and do another uh, performance measurement to see um, if, if that projection is actually being extended slightly. Uh, as we are coming up to that 12 year mark. Um, and then finally, um, our other product, Zenoco. Um, so this um, product's really effective in uh, level crossings. It's it's designed to stop corrosion or it's slow, at least very it slows it down very much. You can't really stop it, but you can you can really uh, slow it down. So level crossings are a, a, a real, real kind of hotspot for what's called stray current corrosion. And this is essentially where electrical currents are leaking into the rail and they, they make um, the corrosion process accelerate. Um, so this is what a rail looked like in a, in a um, level crossing um, after only about three months. Um, so it's, it, you can see this amount of damage after only three to six months on, a, on an, an unprotected rail. And th this, this particular crossing was quite bad because it had poor drainage as well. So the rails were sitting in, in, in water a lot of their life. And then you've got the stray currents coming from all this electrical equipment around the, around the crossing. You've got the beacons, you've got the barriers, you've got the sirens, all that needs electricity. And, and some of that electricity can leak into the rail and, and cause this to happen in a very short time. So that's a rail that was um, taken out of service after only three months. This is a Zenoco coated rail in, in a crossing, and this is after 20 months after after installation. And based on on, on some measurements that we've taken, we're looking at a, a life of around about we think five years. So going from a worst case scenario of a, a three to six months before you have to, and and these are very maintenance intensive uh, structures level crossings because you need a team of people to take up. Well, first of all, you've got to close the road. 
you've then got to send out a team of people to lift up the, the panels. It's it's very kind of um, labour intensive process. Um, so if you can extend that life uh, that the rail needs to be to be inspected, that that's saving a lot of, of energy um, over the life cycle of the product. Um, so that really wraps up um, our presentation. So we'll be happy to take any questions. OK, gents, well, that was, um, yeah, very enlightening. So thank you for that. Um, um, just while people have a little think about any questions they may want to pose either directly verbally uh, or perhaps via the chat. Um, just a little, uh, some observations from me. I think one was there were some great um, images in the still works there. And what struck me was the size of the infrastructure. I mean, this is big kit. And uh, when you think, I mean, especially like the torpedo wagon, I mean, that was something else as well. But I, I have a, I've got a question for you. I'm going to put my supplier's hat on at the moment. When you're looking at um, developing a new steel um, for use on the railway, obviously you want life in service. I accept that. But do you ever take into consideration perhaps um, the ability to either drill into the rail or maybe even to cut the rail? Because when we have things like um, manganese that's used on S and C, obviously that can be a bit of a problem. Um, but I just wondered if that was part of, of the decision making process when you uh, develop new products. Um, yeah, so that all all of that will be taken into account. Um, because there's, yeah, there's many factors um, that you with a rail. You, you don't just want it to be high performing when it's in track, but also the processing of the material, the drilling of the holes, like you say, um, that needs to be taken into account um, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got some questions in the chat here. Uh, one from Thomas. He says, uh, from the standpoint of managing the steel making process, what challenges are presented by offering rail products with different formulations? Um, there's a couple of things to take into account. So um, as we we're a so we, we don't produce currently any heat treated products. So we we achieve our, um, our our rail strength by alloying. Um, so that's one of the one of the considera considerations you need to take into account yeah. is the the cost of that all alloying process. Um, so you know you can you can dump a lot of um, fancy materials um, fancy elements into your steel, but that that is that can be quite a costly process. Um, one of the other things you need to take into account as well is, is weldability. So a great thing to put into steel if you want to make it really hard and really um, tolerant to wear is, is you can put a lot of chromium in there. But when you put a lot of chromium in steel, it becomes very difficult to weld. So there's there's a couple of things to, to balance up. Um, and then on, on the other side, if you want to a premium rail, the other, the other option that you can do is, is, is heat treatment. And again, that's got its own pros and cons um, because it, it can be quite an energy intensive process because you've got to heat up the, the steel to make the rail and then you've got to heat it up again to do the heat treatment. So it can be quite a costly process as well as to do the, the heat treatment. So hopefully, hopefully that's answered your question. Or at thank least, you. yeah. No, thank you. I think it has. Another question here from Rami: What is the main differences between R two sixty and HP three three five in terms of carbon content and hardness value? So the carbon content of R two sixty is is somewhere around about 07 percent carbon, and the carbon content of HP is um, 0.85, 0 0.9% 0 carbon, somewhere around that. I know somebody's going to kick me for saying that because I don't have a specific value off the top of my head, but um, it, that that's kind of the difference, about 0.7 for, for your standard grade and about 0.8 for, for HP. Um, in terms of hardness, so the the names of the, the rail grades, the, the number in the name, um, 
it refers to the minimum Brunel hardness of the product. So R260 has a, a minimum hardness of 260 Brunel. So one of the things that we're required to do when we make a rail um, according to the EN standard is we need to uh, we, we take a piece off the production line essentially and do some quality testing on it. And we'll take three Brunel hardness measurements and the lowest of those three measurements becomes that number um, that you see on the R260 or the HP335 or the R350 uh, whatnot. That's the minimum hardness that you, you will achieve. OK, thank you for that. And then Phil was asked, has there been any changes to the rail head uh, any changes to the rail head profile to manage uh, rail contact fatigue? And if so, has this been applied to HP335? Yeah, yeah. So um, there, there are two main profiles that we supply to the, the UK network. Um, one is, is called 56E1, so 56 kilograms per metre. Um, and the, the E number at the end, um, it just refers to the, to the profile. Um, now there's a 60 kilogram section. So there's a 60E1 and there's a 60E2. And the 60E2 um, has a modified crown radius um, on it. And the, it's, it's got something called gauge corner relief. Um, uh, in the profile and what that does is, is you, if you imagine your your wheel is sitting on your rail and um, there's some there's a relief radius put onto the co the gauge corner of the rail which prevents contact from happening in that area when and that's designed to um, essentially limit RCF um, so rail can be manufactured to either manufactured to an E2 profile or it can be ground in in service um, which is something that Network Rail do as well. And, and HP Rail can be provided in either 56E1 or 60E1 or E2. Great, thank you. Uh, Marco has asked, what is the formulation recipe for HP335, or at least what is the main component that makes such steel high performing? Well, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> but um the one of the main uh things that's in there is is vanadium um so that that's that's one of the things that we give it um gives it its its properties um and then it other than that it's just the high carbon content really that that gives it that boost in strength okay good stuff uh russell's asked at present is the furnace gas or electric and will this change uh, sorry, repeat that again, sorry. Uh, at present, is the furnace gas or electric and will this change? Right, sorry, yeah, yeah. so at, at the moment the furnaces are gas, um, so they, they operate on, um, they're, well they're actually coal and they, they produce gas um, and that gas we, we recycle around the rest of the plants, so we use it to operate our secondary reheat furnaces and also there's some process gases that um, we used to generate steam which we actually used to heat up the offices around the mill as well. Um, so as John alluded to we our plan is to move to a hybrid model in the future um, and use a mixture of, of gas of, of blast furnaces and electric arc furnaces um, so the the, an the 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 key difference between a, a blast furnace and an electric arc furnace, um, an electric arc furnace it doesn't produce steel; it 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 remelts steel. So you need to put scrap steel into an electric arc furnace to produce molten steel, which then you you put into a into a into your products. Um, so the 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 plan that we've announced going forward is it would be to use a mixture of both because it, it it's it's it makes sense to have a some some way of creating new steel um that then at least you can you can put that into your into your electric heart furnace as well so you have a you have the best of both worlds really very good very good um those speakmans asked the question does the increase in durability come at an extra cost what is the material cost comparison 
of R260 versus HP335 and are there welding considerations? OK, so John, you might want to take the, the yeah. cost uh, bit of that, but I'll, I'll address the welding one first. And that's um, in terms for flash put welding and aluminothermic welding, there is um, there are processes for that to flash put weld HP335. The settings of your flash put welder are minusculely different from how you would weld um, HP uh, for how you do, how you weld R260. Um, an alumina, alumina thermic welding, um, the, the welded suppliers um, have developed portions for HP335. Um, when it comes to repair welding, there are repair weld processes for HP335 um, as well. Uh, but it, it's you get this with a, a lot of premium rails. Premium rails can be more sensitive to um, to your welding parameters as well. Um, so you, you need to make sure that 260 is very forgiving. It's got quite a wide window uh, which you can you can weld it in. Whereas the the premium rails and and uh, such as HP335, they've got a, a, a slightly narrower narrower tolerance to to any variations in the process. OK, thank you for that. Uh, another yeah. couple of questions. Sorry, yeah, I'll let John address I, the... I won't dodge the cost question there, Colin, either. So um, <laughs> I'd say in, in the region of, uh, you know, for for the premium over a standard rail, it's in the region of about sort of 10, 15 percent, uh, you know, as sort of the unit cost. But if you refer back to, if you remember the slides that uh, that Steve went through in terms of the you know, the expected life, then, you know, it's, it's it, that's minimal in terms of what, you know, the benefits it's going to give you. So, uh, but... Yes, it's in that sort of ballpark figure. Yeah, very true. OK, um, on the slide you showed us this um, 300 mil square section uh, billet that goes through uh, various different processes and stages. How long does it take before it actually produces the rail going through those rollers? Um, it's it's a relatively quickish process. I, I wouldn't like to put a, a figure on it, but with under five minutes I'd, I'd say i'm sure that there's people shouting at me right now saying no steve it's not that but i you i've, I've been there standing in the middle. within five minutes i think you can see a, a bloom coming in at one end and a finished rail coming out at the other yeah, yeah. okay uh last couple of questions we have here in the chat um one from dominic making has the zinc cocoa coating been used in any light rail applications? Uh, that's a good question. Oh, I think. Not on grooved rail um, as such, but it, um, where you've got off street running on, um, on on light rail networks, there, there could be. I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but that no, because the, the the light rails, or oh, the sort of your, your metro systems are aligned to sort of groove rails that are encapsulated anyway, so there's not yeah. not so much demand for that. Yeah. But um, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, to be honest, whether we, whether we have done that. But you know, the, the same application, the same benefits would apply. So yeah, okay. So there's no reason why it couldn't be um, applied. So okay. Uh, and then uh, one other question we have here: Is there any effect? of increasing hardness value on the wear of rolling stock wheels over time? That is a, a very good question and one that's quite widely debated. Um, there's a lot of evidence to say that increasing the hardness of the rail actually not only reduces the wear of the rail, but it also reduces the wear of the wheel as well. And that's something as, as I, because I've dabbled in the research community in the past, there's, there is some evidence to suggest that, but we don't quite understand why um, at the moment. But there, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that that is the case, that you, you increase the, the hardness of the rail, and the effect of that is to bring down the whole, the total system wear. Um, but there is, there is still quite a lot of work to do in that, that arena. Um, 
but it, it's a it's a legitimate concern of 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 rolling stock um operators is that um the harder rail can can have effects on their their wheels but actually we don't see a lot of evidence that that's the case uh, we, we just need to understand why um it, it has this it seems to have a net benefit um for the whole system is to bring down the, the degradation of both the rail and the wheel um but that's something that the uh, the boffins in universities are busy looking at at the moment okay thank you for that and then we've got uh, drain hamilton i think they got their hand up they want to ask a question directly so i'll hand over to them yeah hamilton drain tfl london underground hi steve john thank you for that that was very interesting because i'm fairly new to rail products so this is uh this is a very interesting presentation but um nothing too technical i, I was just looking at the um the slide on decarbonization and i was just curious to know what the role of hydrogen i couldn't quite understand how hydrogen was helping in that decarbonization process um if if that's known so i think that's um, just trying to find the slide um, just to yeah it was a pic it was lot it was a it was a, a map of pictures and it was like a hillside flowing down and you had scope one. In scope one, there was a, a series of of, uh, of of low carbon asset, yes. And so, right at the end, uh, you have hydrogen and electricity grid decarbonisation. I wasn't quite sure how the what what is the hydrogen doing in this in this. So the, the hydrogen is a big thing, isn't it? Hydrogen. Everyone's talking about hydrogen as as a, as a role is playing a role in many technologies, but. Um, I'm not quite sure what it's doing here. I believe the hydrogen is there is sort of replacing as, a, as an energy source to 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 feed the mills or you know, to feed something on site. Or instead of what natural gas or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, understood. Thank you. What happens is when you remove, as, as Steve said earlier, the blast furnace operation creates natural gas supplies for the rest of the site. So if you if you remove some of the blast furnace operations. You remove some of the energy sources that we've got on our on our own site. You see, so we have to replace them with alternative um, alternative sources, of which hydrogen, I think, is is one of those that's been investigated now. So, understood. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you for that, Hamilton. Um, well, Sorry, I don't I think, think the the other one. Uh, there was a question about where Zenoco has been used in light rail. So, yeah, it has actually been used in London Underground. I think it was installed in in, in Brunel Tunnel a few years ago. And and also some of the earlier trials that we did were done in RATP, which is the Paris Metro as well. So yeah, there there, there are examples of it being being used in the light rail as well. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, well, if there's no more questions, I will ask uh, Howard just to do the the vote of thanks. Howard, the floor is yours. Lovely. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, hear you fine. Yeah, well, thank you very much, John and Stephen, for an excellent presentation. And it's great to see um, an excellent project product still being made in the UK. Um, and with the investment, I mean, I think if you just add up some of the figures, um, it comes over to over 100 million without um, other investment with no figures were put on. So it's great to see that um, investment is still happening um, and hope it carries on for the future and we carry on uh, making steel in Britain. So thank you ever so much for taking the time out. Um, and thank you very much from the Ashford section. Thank okay. you. Well, thanks for your time. Thank you. uh, just the, there is the email address on the top of the screen. So if, if there's any questions you think of later, anybody, just um, don't uh, don't hesitate and drop in as an email and we'll, we'll, we'll respond uh, uh, later. Lovely, thank you.